Freedom of expression is traditionally understood to be a universal principle, mm -hmm. protected by a number of international, regional and uh, national legal instruments. Mm -hmm. Does it have the same meaning everywhere? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, if you look at the different uh, national legal systems, uh, even or in particular those legal systems that are considered to be in line with international standards, uh, you would notice that the, the particular scope, uh, the kind of limits that are introduced, the notion itself of freedom of expression that is used is not completely homogeneous. Uh, this is, well, th I think that this is something that is uh, quite uh, understandable, uh, in particular because um, the truth is that uh, freedom of expression and freedom of information are universal rights. Uh, some people would say that they are basically Western rights because, I mean, the, the seminal moment of freedom of expression and freedom of information took place uh, at the end of the 18th century with the French Revolution and the declaration of, of, of human rights at that, at that moment. But the truth also is that uh, these uh, rights have been incorporated into the set or the, the parameters of uh, in universal international rights. Uh, because the, the Declaration of Human Rights that was uh, adopted after the Second World War and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, they, they both instruments, they have this uh, international vocation. And as a matter of fact, they have been signed and adopted by countries that do not actually belong to the Western uh, European, or Western in general, uh, legal tradition. So now uh, we can say that despite uh, the, these rights come from a Western liberal post-revolutionary tradition, now they have uh, become or they are part of the minimal uh, international standards for the, say, protection of humankind. This being said, uh, if you look at the different, at these different instruments that protect uh, human rights and protect freedom of expression, and freedom of information at the international level, you'd see that uh, they give a lot of a, a very huge margin of appreciation to different states. They, in some ways, they have a very broad and uh, vague wording, uh, which makes possible the existence or the adaptation to these principles. Uh, to the different legal traditions and the different legal systems. It doesn't mean that we have to be absolutely relativist and that we have to accept that every single country has the right to interpret this notion of freedom of expression, of uh, freedom of information, whatever they want, or however they want. But um, the truth is that uh, if we look at the structure of uh, these uh, international instruments, you, you see that there's a paragraph one, for example, Article 19 or Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, a first paragraph in which basically says that uh, freedom of expression and freedom of information are protected as essential rights. But then a second paragraph that says that these rights, uh, they, uh, these are not only rights, that there are some responsibilities that are associated to the exercise of such rights, and that some restrictions can be imposed by law uh, if they are necessary in a democratic society in order to protect some, say, public interest values. And the it's the national states that can impose course, these yes. limitations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, national, nation, national states uh, have the capacity to legislate on this, uh, to adopt a specific, a specific model. Uh, we have also to acknowledge the fact that in some cases, uh, some states have basically signed these international instruments in order to be able to feel that they are part of the international community. But uh, I mean. They have to accept that they haven't, these principles, they haven't been really incorporated to the legal systems. But in other cases, we have to accept that, the, for example, if we look at Europe, for example, the way in which Germany uh, interprets some of the restrictions for the protection of human dignity uh, is different from the Italian vision, for example, of this same area, the Spanish vision, probably, or the Danish vision.
Uh, so even when applying the same provision at the yes, international level, yes, yeah. national courts have yes. a legitimate freedom yes, to, yeah. to adopt different tests. Yeah, no, I mean, if you look, for example, at, at the case law, which is the most, I'd say, most complete and most interesting case law in this area, which is the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, you see in many cases that the court says, okay, uh, I cannot, I, I'm not ga getting into the discussion on whether this limit was legitimate or not, because I think that here it is the margin of appreciation, it's the, these are the criteria of the state that count. Uh, if the state in order to appreciate, to make a certain balance between some kind of national cultural interest and uh, the, the need to protect freedom of expression, the, the, the court has detected, the national court, that it, I mean, the, uh, some priority should be given to the, this public interest. Uh, well, the only thing that we can do is to well to check whether this is motivated, whether this is makes sense, it's rational. But then we leave in the hands of the of the state uh, the the last word uh, on this issue, which is this the famous. I mean, I mentioned this before. This is the idea of the margin of of appreciation. So the local culture can legitimately yes. play a role in yeah, shaping of the, it should, the it should. way in which yes. freedom of speech is practically yes, applied. Yes, yeah, yeah. For example, I mean, uh, in order to to think of something that is not necessarily controversial. The need to protect uh, a minority language may justify the imposition of language quotas. Language quotas are a restriction of freedom of expression because you are obliging someone to broadcast or to devote some of the, the, the airtime uh, to content uh, of a certain language. This is some kind of a restriction. Well, in some countries that can be acceptable, in those countries in which it makes sense, to protect, for example, a minority language that, or a language that needs some special protection in the area of broadcasting. But maybe if you do the same thing in a country that has just a single majoritarian language, it uh, doesn't make sense and it's not proportional. Yeah? So uh, here you see uh, some ideas that are interesting. The idea of margin of, of appreciation, the idea of proportionality, the idea of necessity within the context of a democratic society, because something that the, the court, the European Court of Human Rights, can actually check is whether the objective or the, the interest that is being protected is an interest that is acceptable or that is worth protecting within the context of a democratic society. This is something that can be controlled by, by the court. I have also to say that uh, this is, I'm, I would say, the, the, the kind of a universal framework, but if you look, for example, at the US legal system, we don't find any trace of, of all these things. I mean, basically, the United States still have uh, the protection that uh, derives from the First Amendment uh, that was drafted at the end of the 18th century with a very, let's say, uh, absolutist uh, vision of, of, of freedom of, of expression with a very a restrictive view on possible limitations on freedom of expression. And uh, this uh, scheme of uh, general rule and then exceptions and public interest is something that does not exist at all within the context of, uh, of the First Amendment. And uh, if you look at the, at the case law of the US Supreme Court, you would see that uh, basically uh, the, the criteria are those that I've just mentioned. This idea of giving a great supremacy to freedom of expression, not only to, to freedom of expression exerced by individuals, but also to freedom of expression exerted by big corporations or big uh, entities, uh, and to allow a very, very, very few restrictions. And I think that going beyond uh, this idea of proportionality that uh, applies uh, in other parts of the world. The general principle of freedom of expression can be unpacked into a number of different rights mm -hmm. at stake, including, for instance, the right to seek, mm -hmm. receive, and mm -hmm. impart information, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. stated by Article 19 of mm -hmm. the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Mm. The concept of seeking for information recalls the traditional role of journalists mm -hmm. that um, um, research and gather information mm -hmm. through different sources mm -hmm. like interviews, um, for mm. instance. Their role is traditionally protecting under what is called journalistic freedom. Mm -hmm. What it consists of? 
Well, basically, uh, here I think that it is worth to make a distinction between freedom of speech, which is the right to impart ideas, opinions, thoughts, the right to create, uh, and then the right to freedom of information. Because the right to freedom of information has to do with the dissemination of news, of information. That is to say, of facts. Uh, and I think that we should make a very clear distinction between opinions, thoughts, uh, uh, creations and facts. Uh, and I would say that the constitutional protection and the let's say, legal dynamics of both rights, even if they are both normally included under the big umbrella of freedom of expression, uh, are completely uh, different. Uh, for example, I mean, when you, uh, in some cases, when you say that uh, news in order to be protected, or information in order to be protected, should be accurate, uh, which is quite uh, understandable, uh, this is something that you cannot apply, for example, to opinions. Opinions cannot be, I mean, you cannot uh, restrict opinions because they are not accurate, because opinions are not accurate or inaccurate, it, they are just opinions. Huh? So, I mean, uh, it is important to think that these two different rights are different huh? in many aspects, also in terms of limits, requirements and scope. And now you're referring basically to the second right, which is the right to information, uh, which is basically an active right. Uh, in many constitutions and in general, if you look at the case law, basically uh, you can find that from a legal point of view, the real strength of this uh, right has to do with the possibility in, within a democratic society to have people who are seeking information and then they disseminate it more than a, just a mere passive right of receiving uh, what is being provided. Because without this active side of the right, the passive side of the right has no sense at all. You don't have a general right to be informed about, about everything. Uh, basically, your passive right to receive information is quite connected to the existence of someone who's trying to disseminate. Uh, so it means that uh, the particular activity mm -hmm. of seeking and um, disseminating yes. information comes with specific yes. um, responsibilities and, and entitlements. Yes. Yeah. Um, in what sense these protections, mm. these legal protections or entitlements mm. are different for those who are um, trying to disseminate information mm -hmm. through uh, the general public? Yeah. Well, this is, at least this is the traditional approach to freedom of information that in some constitutions, for example in the US constitution, uh, is, uh, well, is named after the name of freedom of the press, not freedom of information. So there's something called the press, which is a particular part of the society, a particular state. Huh? Which uh, is a bit of an old-fashioned uh, way yeah, to, uh, to mean the media. Just a bit, a bit of, yeah, uh, the media. Uh, those who have the, let's say, professional responsibility or they, uh, they uh, do this uh, particular activity consisting of disseminating uh, information. And in most legal uh, systems, uh, these actors are particularly protected because it is considered that they deserve a particular protection. In general, uh, all the constitutions would say that freedom of information, even from the active side, uh, belongs, it's a right that belongs to everyone, not only to journalists. But as a matter of fact, uh, many, many legal systems, uh, almost all legal systems, they particularly protect journalists uh, because they Can are Can you name a few examples of the particular, uh, of yeah. Practical legal protections yeah. that well, journalists hmm. are granted with. Yeah, well, for example, I mean, I mentioned that, for example, the, the, the US Constitution mentioned this idea of freedom of the press, not freedom of information. But apart from that, in general, I mean, for example, in, in Europe and other parts of the world, for example, mm, the right uh, to preserve, uh, not, to, mm, not to reveal the sources of information. This is something that basically is recognized to journalists. Uh, even now, if now this raises, may raise problems, because what if, a, let's say, uh, a person who has a, a very active account on Twitter, who cannot be considered 
as a professional journalism, uh, has disseminated an information and this person needs really to protect uh, the identity of his sources. Probably most, of most judges of many, many uh, countries would say that they have not the right to protect their sources because they are not journalists. So it's an evolving concept. Uh, it's an evolving uh, concept. Yeah. So, I mean, on one side you have rights, but on the other side you have also responsibilities. For example, the, decree, the degree of accuracy that normally is, uh, uh, that, uh, normally it is imposed to a journalist in order to avoid, for example, a condemn uh, an issue of defamation, for example, is higher than the, the level of accuracy that normally is required to a blogger, for example. Uh, so mm. these are the two sides uh, of the same thing. On one side, as a journalist, to the extent that you are protected as, as a journalist, you have a special regime that normally is uh, everywhere. I mean, the US, in Europe, and uh, other parts of the world, you, you deserve a special protection. But on the other hand, the legal system, uh, they will, will be very exigent, will be ask you to be, uh, to, let's say, respect some professional rules that you are supposed to know uh, uh, because you are a professional journalist. Another thing, is the definition of a professional journalist. Uh, because this is a tricky question from an international point of view, because basically international standards establish that even if you can have within the legal system this notion of professional journalism, you cannot have a system of licensing journalists. It means that you have to go before the state and to ask for a kind of a, a, a license or a permit to, to be a journalist. So in many, many legal systems, uh, on one hand, you have journalists and uh, let's say the legal system acknowledges the existence of something called journalists. But on the other side, it's impossible to find a single definition <laughs> of what a journalist is. So the notion is evolving. It's evolving legal yeah. protections are evolving as well, yes. but the different answers vary yeah. from, from yes. jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Yes. Yeah. And because we have to acknowledge that now uh, the role, the significant role uh, that uh, in the past or traditionally has been played by traditional media, uh, which was the reason beyond this special protection, now is also played by other actors. For example, this is an, uh, an example that uh, I used to put. Uh, if there's an earthquake here now, which is not probable, but if there's a, an, an earthquake uh, here in Oxford, uh, the earthquake will be felt in Twitter uh, 30 seconds later. Right. 30 seconds after the earthquake takes place, uh, well, I mean, someone will be tweeting for sure that there has been an earthquake or something, or a kind of a tremor huh? uh, in Oxford. Uh, whereas if you have to wait for the Guardian or the Times in order to inform about that, maybe we'll have to wait for an hour or something like that. Huh? So, I mean, at this present moment, huh, uh, these uh, new actors are relevant. Uh, in terms of uh, disseminating re relevant information, in terms of the formation of the public opinion, so on and so forth. So it makes sense uh, to think that they are uh, coming closer to this traditional position that uh, journalists used to have. But on the other hand, uh, if you are coherent with this approach, then you would have to say that maybe uh, this uh, so people who are uh, tweeting or blogging, they have to assume that maybe some special responsibilities may be imposed to them, which is something that now uh, it's not accepted, it's not clear to what extent, uh, right. if there are different degrees, which is, uh, this is a still a very, very, uh, a very difficult uh, issue. I mean, basically because, as I mentioned, uh, nowadays judges in many countries will not accept giving to a blogger the same privileges hmm? as a journalist. As a you journalist. also mentioned that freedom of expression has a passive layer. Yes. The right to receive information, yes. yeah. which um, stems, I understand, from the, fr from the idea that the wide circulation and availability mm -hmm. of information is the pillar or mm -hmm. one of the pillars for mm -hmm. the functioning mm -hmm. of a democracy. 
um, basic, a basic understanding of this principle would be that uh, um, it prohibits governments from restricting a person from receiving information that That's someone right. else is trying, is yes. willing to impart to them. Well, that would be one specific vision. Maybe there are other visions, but this, one be the th this is the basic definition. Yeah, That would be the first one, which is a very traditional liberal definition, which is government shouldn't interfere in the dissemination of information. If government interferes in this area, the government is violating this specific right. Apart from this, you know that uh, mm, in many countries, uh, for example, the US, the UK, and other parts of the world, they have uh, these laws called Freedom of Information Act. And these laws basically uh, make a connection between the citizen and the public system or the public institutions, eh? which basically means that uh, public institutions play an active role in the dissemination of information, which means that the citizen has the right to have access to information that is in the hands of the public sector. And the public sector, if I understood correctly, also has a positive obligation of providing the information. So not just the um, the prohibition no, to it's impose not, it's not limits, yes. but an active obligation to yes. take action yes. to provide the information, to, provide to the make information. the information available. Yes, yes. Information that is considered to be relevant because normally information that is in the hands of the public sector is in information that has some kind of a political relevance, it has to do with the provision of public services, it has to do with uh, you know, the economic dynamics of the country, things like that. So it makes sense that citizens should have access to, let's say, a transparent, a transparent uh, public administration. This is another possible vision of the right to, to freedom of, of information from the point of view of, of, of citizens. And now it's being protected in several countries, not in all the countries of the world, because, for example, in Spain, my case, we don't have such a law, even if we have been appointed several times because of not having it, eh, because most Western countries have them. But another thing is to what extent uh, you protect this right. And the, here you have all these laws protecting security, uh, not, not only privacy, because this is another thing, but protecting security, national defense, uh, mm, private, uh, uh, this thing of uh, official secrets, etc., etc., etc. And this yeah. is another area in which a few international standards exist, yeah. but then yeah. it's pretty much up yeah. to the, to the um, state institutions to decide yes. what should be kept secret for the sake of security yeah. and other national yeah. interests and what can be yes. made available to Well, the a very interesting thing, and this is, a very, very, this, very, this is very related to current events, is that uh, until nowadays this was such a national issue. UK decided huh, what uh, was necessary in order to prevent the disclosure of certain information that could be harmful in terms of national security. And basically, you committed a crime if you disseminated this information within the UK right. using a uh, British newspaper, etc., etc. But now we have seen that you can use the new technologies in order to disseminate this information from the other side of the world. And probably, w from a legal point of view, we should say that you are not committing any crime if you are disclosing British secrets from a computer that is on the other side of the world. Because you're not under the jurisdiction. You are not under the jurisdiction, you are on another country. Uh, for example, in the, if you are in the US or in Paraguay, uh, you will not find a single piece of legislation in Paraguay that protects British secrets. Uh, so now I think that we have to move towards uh, an international debate on the limits of freedom of information and to what extent national security can become, or national defense can become a kind of an international public interest that may justify at the international level, basically uh, regarding the internet, the public disclosure of something that can be really harmful for the interests of, of countries. Yeah? So this is a very interesting uh, debate and I think that uh, many international organizations have started this, this discussion because of course uh, protecting freedom of information must be the priority, must be say the general rule and restricting it uh, uh, 
for the sake of uh, national security must be the exception, the very motivated exception. But I think that nowadays, I mean, current uh, events have shown that uh, this is something that should be tackled not only at the national level, uh, but also at the international level. And finally, I would say that there's another third area in which we can talk about the right of citizens to receive uh, information from someone else, which is public service broadcasting. Many countries, not the case of the US, because they don't have public service broadcasting there, but uh, in the solid European tradition of public service broadcasting, you find that many laws in the UK, in Italy, in Spain, in Germany, they protect the right of citizens to have something called the public service broadcaster, which is the provider of a public service consisting on the dissemination of information, content, er entertainment. Which and again suggests of a, of a positive obligation of a positive on the state yeah, to disseminate it. information. Yeah, yeah. And finally, if you want, the state may have another positive obligation, which is the, pos the obligation of removing the obstacles uh, introduced by private entities to the access of information. Think, for example, of the role of internet intermediaries. Exactly. Now, those who have capacity to restrict the free flow of ideas in the internet are not the states. Of course, the states also have this capacity, but in general, in democratic system, uh, the main concern comes from the capacity that intermediaries, telecom companies, search engines, uh, portals, etc., etc., have in order to interfere, to block, uh, to orient our navigation, uh, avoiding certain specific websites. So I would say that uh, I think it is the fourth area that we are mentioning, uh, a possible fourth area for the action of the state uh, in order to safeguard, to warranty freedom of information consists of removing the obstacles being put by, by those that now have the capacity, the non-democratic capacity, to regulate the free flow of information within the uh, electronic networks. Interesting. Thank you very much, John. No, thanks to you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.